walk us through that Alzheimer's study and what you found there. Absolutely. And I think as I'm getting into our research, let me just make sure that all of our listeners are clear that I'm not talking about utilizing nutrition to treat disease. I know that's a very touchy subject and something, you know, in terms of regulatory issues in our yeah, country, we do. Gonna say it. <laughs> I imagine you do that as well in New Zealand, but I just want everybody to make sure that no one thinks Lewis is saying we're using nutrition to treat disease. What we're doing is using the power of nutrition to provide the raw materials that the cells need to function properly guided by our genes. And so with that said, we put <clears throat> people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease on our dietary supplement formulation that included the aloe and rice bran polysaccharides, among a couple of other things. And we followed them for 12 months. We didn't change their diet, their medicine. We didn't exercise them, put them on any other treatment or therapy. We literally just gave them the dietary supplement and we told them to basically maintain their lifestyle the same way they always do. And of course, this was in most cases, the caregiver, not the person, him or herself. Yeah. And of course, you know, if you have an emergency, obviously you have to take care of that situation, but otherwise just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Don't change anything else. And so with the amount of funding we had, we were able to do the, the neuropsych or the cognitive testing at baseline three, six, nine, and 12 months. And then we drew blood at baseline in 12 months. Mm -hmm. So we were based on Dr. Reg's, um, you know, previous work with individuals. We were very optimistic. We were very hopeful that our study would show something. But quite frankly, since it was the first clinical trial, we didn't really have any idea what, you know, ultimately at the end of the day we would show, especially for a 12 month intervention. I mean, if for any of you who are listening and you know something about clinical research, you know that dealing with human beings is very challenging. I mean, it's not like studying cells or tissues or rats. You know, those are very, very easy subjects to manipulate and and control their environment. Humans are, you know, don't, don't follow the rules, do they? <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, they may show up late to an appointment or they may no, not show up at all or, you know, drop out. You know? That's exactly right. <laughs> However, on the on the other hand, compared to some of the other studies that I conducted, I can tell you that, and you know this in, in taking care of your mother, that the people who are caregivers of someone with an Alzheimer's condition, be it a parent or a spouse or whatever, they literally are the most motivated care yeah. group of caregivers you will meet in the world because they know from a medical perspective, there's nothing that can be done for their loved one. So they are literally so willing to try anything out of sh just nothing more than sheer desperation. Can relate to, to try that. Something will, you know, something will help. <clears throat> so as we're conducting the study, and oh, by the way, I didn't mention that the psychiatrist and some of the other staff members, they were very skeptical. They were like, well, we think this is nonsense. This is nutrition. You know, we're into drugs. You know, we're, we only... <laughs> we only study drugs here. You know, we're all about drugs. And uh, Dr. Reg and I, you know, he, he came no into comment. Miami. <laughs> exactly. Of course, he flew into town, you know, to meet, to kick off the study. And, and he and I kind of looked at each other very, you know, like with, wow, like, you know, these people are really just brash about their skepticism. They're not even trying to hide it. But mm -hmm. we, you know, we start the study and we start enrolling people. And, the, and again, these are moderate to severe severity patients. These are not like, mild dementia or newly diagnosed they had to have the disease at least for one year and they were basically you know the worst severe cases and these are again people that big pharma they big pharma cares nothing about these people they they look at them as lost causes basically from a research perspective mm, so we start running the study and we start you know conducting everything and meanwhile i start little by little information starts trickling in anecdotally i start getting phone calls from caregivers. Oh, Dr. Lewis, uh, my loved one is now talking about things, doing things that he or she hasn't done in some cases in years. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting these kinds of wow. reports coming. The oldest lady in the study was 93 and she had had the disease for like 11 years, was sitting in a chair and could not speak. I mean, just basically like a piece of furniture on top of a piece of furniture, just didn't have any ability to do anything in life. We enrolled her in the study. It was not even the three-month assessment. At some point between baseline and the third month, she actually started walking again. She walked in the center one day, and she called one of the clinical coordinators by his first name. That guy started crying like a baby. He, It was so emotionally moving and powerful for him 
to actually see this lady walk again and remember his name for the very first time, he started crying like a baby. And I always get chills every time I, I tell this story just because of how emotionally powerful this, this work is. I mean, it's one thing to do great science and be a good ethical scientist, but when you can actually uh, you know, show benefit to people's lives, that's a whole different level of totally. success and, and gratification. So <clears throat> as these things happen, and of course, it took us a couple of years to run this study, we enrolled 34 people. And so over a 12 month intervention, you know, it took time to, to do all this. So we finished the study, and now we're analyzing the data. And so Dr. McDaniel and I were most excited about the cognitive functioning data that we had, and, and we started looking at that. And so we used as part of our measure, the ADAS-COG, mm -hmm. which is widely considered to be the gold standard for assessing cognitive function yep. people with dementia. It's been published in thousands of papers at this point. It's been around for decades. And <clears throat> we showed clinically and statistically significant improvement in cognitive function at nine and 12 months. Wow. That's Lisa, amazing. that's no, yep, that's unheard of. And I and I want to make sure that our listeners are clear on the distinction between clinically and statistically significant. So you can have a study with large numbers of subjects, hundreds or thousands. It's easy to show statistical significance when you have huge numbers just due to the law of numbers. That's what you'll get just randomly, you'll get statistical significance. But does it have any clinical or practical value to it? So that's the question. So with the ADAS COG, if you show a change in the score of four points or more in either direction, whether it's improvement or deterioration, that's considered clinically significant. And we showed that at nine and 12 months. Wow. So look at, I mean, again, don't take my word for it. Go to PubMed, you know, do your own research, do your own literature search. But I... I always, anytime I have interviewed, I always challenge people, show me one other study that shows anything similar in people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And oh, by the way, they were on average 79.9 years of age. Wow. And they, they didn't just have Alzheimer's. They had diabetes, depression, different forms of heart disease, all other sorts of comorbid issues. So these were very old, very sick folks that we showed these changes. On the cellular level, <clears throat> we showed an improvement in the CD4 to CD8 ratio. That's our ratio of helper cells to cytotoxic Toxic. cells. That's yep. for all of us, not just for people with Alzheimer's. We showed reductions in TNF-alpha and VEGF. These are two, two proteins that are commonly looked at in heart disease and cancer. Our paper was probably the first paper that showed that kind of improvement in people with Alzheimer's disease. And then we also showed in that first paper an increase of adult stem cell production, according to CD14 cells, just under 300% improvement over that 12-month period. Wow. Can we double down on that one? Because that's pretty amazing, right? We, we need stem cells are what help heal our body. And so to get the CD14 right. levels up is pretty, that's phenomenal. 